Welcome to our first lecture. Today I want to do some uh, introduction about uh, NX motion. Basically, we use uh, motion analysis for the loading setups or to find the motion problems, clearances, and defining different boundaries. So it's necessary to learn how to set up a motion analysis. Before that, uh, I have to set up an assembly in the modeling application of NX. So since you're already familiar with this modeling part, I'm not gonna explain that much, but I'm not going to miss any steps. So you can follow and to make uh, same setup. Basically, I'm trying to make a robotic arm. So later on, we're going to uh, control this robot and see some movement. First, I need to make a new assembly file. From here, you can put the uh, template on assembly and a new name and click OK. If you have any components already there, you could add it, but I'm going to go add new components. So I put it on model in the template. I just name it the base. This is the base of the robot. It will ask if you want to choose any existing component, but I don't have any. So I will start from scratch. Make sure you are selecting the arm base as the work part before you start sketching. Otherwise, you will start sketching on the assembly, which is the ARM ASM. So if you look at the left on the assembly navigator, you see that ARM underlying base is selected as work part. So we are okay. I'm gonna do some extrude to make a base. Looks fine. And now with double click, I can go up to the assembly level or parent. Here I make another part. So this is the procedure of adding different parts to the assembly. Then I double click on it again before starting the sketch. And I go to the sketching. Now you don't need to be worried about where you actually uh, start your sketching because later on uh, they're gonna move them around and constrain them to each other so there's no problem with placing your parts for now Notes that I'm using X on the keyboard uh, to start extrude where instead of clicking on the extrude on the menu. You can see all the keystrokes in the right of the screen.
So our second part is almost finished. I just want to add some more details to this one, like adding some text to it. So uh, I move on with adding some text, but later on we're going to remove this text to do uh, some simulation. I just want to show how easy it is to have the details on the assembly level in the modeling application and then remove them later on in an idealized part easily and do the finite element simulation. Now here I make a new part, but you can see that I'm still on assembly level and uh, mistakenly I start doing a sketching. And this is one of the things wrong with NX. You don't get any warning that you're sketching on assembly level. You didn't make, uh, you didn't select your new part. So it you might waste some time before you notice that you are on the assembly level and uh, you need to switch back to the new part that you made. So don't forget to check the assembly navigator. You can still see that the assembly, main assembly is highlighted instead of uh, arm underline two. So I'm drawing it on the assembly level now. And here is another problem with NX. You see that uh, I have a constraint. I want to have a new constraint, but uh, it's the automatic constraint was on. So it is, uh, coincides. These uh, two rectangles are coinciding. I can't move it around. And you can see that uh, I try to remove all the constraints and Notice that I'm still on the assembly level, so it's all wrong. I have to do it again. But you can see that how much time you're going to waste uh, because there are no warnings, first of all. Secondly, default settings are not good. It's all, the automatic constraint is always on. And if you turn it off, you have to do a lot of work. So automatic constraint is not really a smart on Enix. So here, here I found that I'm on the assembly level. So I use control Z twice and then I go back to arm two level with double click and I start drawing again here. Now this time I'm not using the automatic constraints to make things easier.
now we can uh, put this stuff together by using assembly constraint. So go back to the assembly level and use assembly constraint. Here, uh, first I use uh, concentric constraint, but uh, you can see that uh, here the problem is that I want to have a clearance gap between these two, so I better do a cylindrical constraint. Here on a joint or couplers, you can use a cylindrical. Here in NX, uh, NX is asking too many questions for just doing a cylindrical assembly. Uh, so you have to select vectors and points, even though only the vector is important, the points are going to move toward each other. So I have the cylindrical assembly, and then I can use the center to center these two parts together. Uh, here I use two to two, so it means that it will put these two faces in the center of these other two on the other part, as you can see.
to start the motion analysis, uh, you can go to the application in the menu and click on the motion. Now, there are two ways to do motion analysis in NX. One is this option, which says motion. The other one is Mechatronics Concept Designer. The difference is in large displacements and complex movements. So if you have large displacement, like something moving around on the ground or not fixed to anything, you go with motion or when you have some complex complexities like contact, for example. But in uh, Mechatronic Concept Designer, you have this ability to do your simulation interactively. So you can change some numbers, for example, on a CNC table. Let's say you are designing a CNC table. So you can change some numbers and your machine moves immediately according to those numbers. While in motion analysis, you set up some loading and boundary conditions run the simulation and then see the result. The, this is uh, different in mechatronic concept designer. When you see the result immediately and you can play with different numbers and values and see the effect. Before I start the motion analysis, let's have a look on the overall view of the uh, motion analysis with NX. When you move to the uh, NX motion and uh, make a new simulation, you will see this new ribbon. Now, uh, depending on the solver that you choose, some of the icons are grayed out. And now NX motion has three different solvers. Here we are using Ricoh Diamond because it's easier to couple with MATLAB and the default one, SimCenter, is not providing us more useful stuff. It has, for example, a discrete drivetrain and roads and wheels and stuff like that. Uh, it is good, but Ricoh Diamond is doing our job and <clears throat> it's easier to work with. So we continue with that. A lot of the stuff are similar between the solvers. So uh, from starting from left, there's the solution. And this solution is something that you have it in most NX applications. You can make different solutions. You can make multiple solutions on one case. And it is carrying some basic information, some general parameters about your simulation, like uh, your time steps, solution types, analysis types, the type of numerical method, and stuff like that. Now, under solution, you have these four different solution types. You have a normal run that we're going to use. <clears throat> you have articulation. It's kind of interactive solution. For example, you change some forces and you see the movement immediately. Then uh, for in articulation, you cannot drive joints, for example, because it needs to solve it fast. But if you have some complicated stuff like contact, it's going to take a lot of time. We're going to get into that later. You have a spreadsheet run, we're not going to use that. It reads boundary conditions and other stuff from the spreadsheet and uh, solves the problem. Then uh, you have flexible body, which, which couples the Unix motion to finite element method, which is very useful. We're going to use this later and talk about it. Under OSS type, we have kinematics, statics, and control. Now, the static is the static is just a static uh, equation. It's just solving the static equation. So there is no movement involved. The kinematics dynamics and control dynamics difference is that you have control option. So if you want to do control with MATLAB or control in NX motion, you can do control in NX motion as well you choose the last option, control dynamics. So it, the control dynamics is, act, is 
it includes the other two. So if you have enough computational power and you want to have all the options available, you go with control dynamics. Now, if you go with kinematics dynamics or control dynamics on their environment, you have the option to choose between them. Again, here kinematics is just part of dynamics. You only choose kinematics where you don't need to see forces or reactions and you want to keep keep it simple and limited only to displacement velocities and acceleration. You're not going to deal with forces. Again, <clears throat> it reduces the computation cost or simulation time, but you don't get much information. So we're going to do dynamics here and because we want to use all the options. If you choose that, and if you choose control dynamics, you're going to have motor drive, co-simulation, and flexible body options available on their environment. If you check co-simulation, it makes use of MATLAB available. So you can co-simulate with MATLAB Simulink. If, if you check flexible body dynamics, you can transfer bodies, meshed bodies from final element to motion simulation. And if you check component-based simulation, it basically says that you want to use your assembly that you had in modeling app here in motion, which is the recommended method. Because you can draw some shapes and solids on NX motion as well, but it is recommended to bring it from modeling the similar way we did. So I leave it checked here. I'm going to do all of these things again during the tutorial. Then uh, the next tab, we have motion bodies here. It's one of the most important parts. Objects, parts are actually motion bodies. This one was named link in the older versions. It, NX has some problem, I guess, with naming every version that uh, comes out they change some names so it was named uh, linked or links sorry no they changed it to emotion but it basically defines things that can move in your motion simulation if you go with the result that you see in the beginning that detects uh, the motion bodies and joins automatically it will assign each part to a motion body. I will talk about motion body later on, but for now it's enough to know that it just defines different objects. Joints is defining joints connections between the motion bodies. I'm going to talk about it later. Driver is being used to drive joints. You can define uh, drivers to move the stuff around. Marker is being used to trace some movements or capture some stuff. Now, the uh, smart point is exactly the same as a marker, but marker has to be on an object, but a smart point can be anywhere on this space. So for example, if you want to measure the movement of tip of your robot, you put a marker on the hand of the robot, on the arm, and you put a smart point somewhere in this space. So you can measure the distance between these two. Uh, speaking of the measurement, you can use the sensor to measure the distance between markers, the absolute position of a motion body, the force that is acting on a link, or some other stuff that are sensible. Next, uh, we have couplers. We have gear couplers, cables, rack and pinion, two, three joint couplers that you can use to connect joints together. And uh, I'm gonna uh, explain other tabs later on as, as we uh, move to uh, the tutorial. Now let's talk about motion bodies. As I said, <clears throat> this can be automatically defined by using the wizard when you 
make a new simulation motion study but i recommend to do it manually because for example you have let's say a body part a robot part like the arm that has let's say 20 screws a fuse box a control box different parts but they are moved together right if you want to define it as a rigid body because motion bodies are rigid bodies everything is rigid in motion simulation unless you define it as flexible body which we're going to talk about it later it's going to act as a rigid body and the software considers it as a point mass on the center of mass so no matter how it looks to software it looks like a point that is located on the center of mass so you have to make sure that the center of mass is placed correctly if you go with the automatic option and the numbers for mass the values for mass and uh, second moment of inertia are correct these values are being automatically calculated based on the material you assign during the modeling i think uh, my default is on a steel so <clears throat> it is just calculating uh, the mass of the part according to the material i had uh, in the modeling now you you can also add multiple parts as i said to one motion body this will save a lot of time during the simulation because if you don't do that then you need to use fixed joint or gluing to connect different motion bodies where you can here just assign everything under one motion body and they will all move together now you can also uh, put this on user defined mass properties option and change it as you desire for example it is useful when you want to increase the mass of a part and see how it behaves if it was heavier for example next is joint here you define joint and uh, we're going to focus a little bit on this and go into details because our fo focus is on uh, <coughs> joining and connecting methods so I'm going to explain a little bit more here. Obviously, joints are for connecting motion bodies. And these types are nothing but different uh, uh, degrees of freedom. So by choosing each type, you are changing the degrees of freedom, turning them on and off, or relating them to each other. So let's take a look one by one. The first one is revolute. So this one is basically a hinge. When for all types you have the select motion body where you select the motion body that you want to put the joint on, then specify the origin. This is not the origin of the motion body, but the origin of the joint. For example, if you have a hinge, here on Z axis is going to be your origin. <coughs> and you specify a vector that defines the Z axis, that you have the rotation around that vector. Now, if you use a base, if you select the base, choose a motion body for the base, this will snap your uh, motion body to the origin of that base. So it will be jointed on the origin of the base. If you don't select the base, it will just make a joint somewhere in the space, not relative to another motion body. And uh, <clears throat> here you have the option to change the scale. This is just uh, changing how it looks, changes the size of the icon that you have on uh, the screen. Next type is a slider. In this type, you only have one degree of freedom. It's basically like a rail, so there is no rotation in this type. You can see you have the same options. You choose the motion body that you need to slide. If it is slides relative to something else, you select the base for it. And 
the thing is how you define action, how you determine action and base, basically whatever that moves more is going to be the action body. But generally, there is no difference for the software. You can uh, replace base with action. It still works. But it's better to define action as the body that moves more. For example, here, if the green part is moving more and the yellow part is stationary, you use you just set the base part as the yellow one. The uh, <clears throat> next one is cylindrical, pretty similar to slider, but now you have rotation movement. And uh, the uh, sliding movement. So you have two degrees of freedom. Options are same. Next one is a screw. Here you basically have two degrees of freedom, but since these two are related to each other, you end up with one degree of freedom. Okay, so uh, you have the rotation movement and a sliding movement but the rotation is connected to the sliding so as you rotate it will slide so it mimics a leader screw actually so this is the perfect option for making a leader screw or even a screw nut and modeling that and the ratio value determines the pitch of the screw how much it slides given the amount or value of rotation Next one is universal join. <clears throat> this one I will talk when we go to the uh, constant velocity join, but it basically is a universal cardon join, uh, which you can uh, define with different uh, cross spin vectors and uh, spin vectors. You're gonna see some examples on uh, universal join later. Then you have a spherical join, pretty obvious from the picture it's like a shoulder joint but you also have the twist here so it twists as well so you have all freedoms except transitional degrees of freedom it can only ro rotate related to each other the planar movement uh, you have like the surfaces remain planar between two objects I don't know uh, a good example, a physical example of this one, but it's like moving a, an object on a table where you can't lift the object. So you have X and Y movements and rotation. You can't go uh, it, uh, on the Z axis and it cannot rotate on any other axis. So it's like it's uh, the surfaces are connected to each other. And we have fixed condition, which is uh, like a fixed constraint in assembly. If here, if you don't select the base, it will fix your motion body somewhere in a space on the origin point. If you select the base, it will just glue two uh, motion bodies together. And also on the motion navigation uh, panel, you see a, a little change on the icon that shows this body is actually grounded or fixed. Then we have constant velocity uh, joint. This is pretty much like a universal joint, but the spin velocities are constant. Now, this is a bit complicated, but uh, you can see on the movies I have on the right side, top one is the constant velocity joint. You can see the uh, green axis and red axis are turning with the same velocity. The reason is that they have balls, steel balls transferring the load and movement. So it is free to slide as you can see. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the velocity on both axes will remain the same. Where in a carton joint or a universal joint, if you notice, the uh, velocity is changing a little bit. So it's like a sinusoidal 
uh, movement where velocity is going up and down. And if you have it, it, it all depends on the angle between two axes. On 90 degrees, which is the limit for the universal joint, you just lock the joint. It doesn't move at all. So here I have it on close to 90 degrees. So you see that change in velocity better here. If both axes are parallel, you won't see any difference in the velocity. And there are ways to uh, compensate for this kind of velocity change, which is basically adding another universal joint, which is called double universal joint. But in practice, the constant velocity is being used in cars and other machines because with one joint, you can get the same velocity on both sides. But it's a bit more complicated. You have steel balls, you need perfect alignment and clearance where you don't need it in universal joint. Moving on to the uh, other joint types, we get to something called uh, primitive joints. These are the primitive joints at point in line in plane orientation, parallel and perpendicular. These are basically the same things, but uh, here if you use them, it gives you the uh, mathematical option to actually turn on and off a uh, degree of freedom. So you can, for example, have a revolute option by applying two in line and one at point joints. So you are not going to use them because uh, the uh, other joint types are enough. And these are for places that you have complicated motions that are not possible to do with conventional joint types. Now let's go back to the uh, tutorial. Here, uh, click on the motion on the application tab, and that uh, moves you to the motion simulation application. Here, you can start the new simulation by clicking on new simulation, and that will open uh, a window to assign a file. This is going to be a .sim file, which is associated with your simulation. It will open the environment tab. We can change this later, but for now, check the component-based simulation to import everything from the assembly and click OK. Here you see on the wizard that it will try to bring the uh, joint we defined in assembly to the motion simulation, which is usually helpful but I recommend doing uh, joints manually. You can check them in the list and uh, deactivate if you didn't need it. But if you click OK, it will automatically bring all motion bodies based on the parts and uh, all joints are uh, based on the constraints. But I'm going to do it again and uh, without importing, without using that wizard. So I'm going to do it manually. I'm going to assign motion bodies and joints manually. Next, uh, I want to change the solver to recordine. The default one is sim center. I change it to recordine and then I save the simulation. I start defining motion bodies. You select the motion body and it will automatically uh, set the uh, mass and inertia properties. You can also set a name and click OK. You see uh, there is a joint defined automatically when you see when you say or when you check the fixed motion body. Continue doing that 
for all the parts. So all parts now are defined as motion bodies. Uh, here I made a mistake to find the two joints. You see, if you click on a joint, you will see the color change in the associated motion body. So you can see which uh, motion bodies are associated to that particular joint. Now let's define the joints. Most joints we have here are revolute. An option in all joints called a snap motion bodies. This will move your action body to the base body. You also have friction in the tab, so you can't define friction in a joint that makes it more realistic, like a bearing, for example, or a bushing.
now that the motion bodies and joints are defined, we can move on to uh, defining a driver to uh, be used to move a joint or drive a joint. So if you click on the driver, here uh, you see that you can uh, select driver object, which is basically a joint. And uh, you can select different uh, options for it. Here, if you select the join, then under rotation, you get uh, different options which you can select. Another option is to drive the joints from here. So if you double click on a joint, you can go to driver. You see the same options as the driver. But the advantage of defining a driver is that you can use it on different joints immediately. Here, I'm going to drive the joint directly from driver tab with uh, like 10 rounds per minute. Now I need to define a solution. Here, if you click on the solution on this window, you can uh, set the solution and analysis type as we talked before, and time steps and other parameters that are needed for running the numerical method. You can see here that OK button and apply are grayed out, which we're going to fix. You can specify the direction of gravity, which is uh, correct in this case. And uh, then we need to move to the environment to make this available. So we need to change uh, settings and environment. The solution analysis type is dynamics. And we want to have motor drive, code simulation, and flexible bodies. If we go back to the solution, now we have the OK available. And we can choose control dynamics. I double check the gravity and click OK. Now we can solve. It's pretty fast since we don't have any contacts in the system. And if you move to result and play, you will see the result. It's like a drunk robot. It's just the gravity acting on it. And uh, you see that uh, I made a mistake defining uh, one of the grabbers, one of the fingers of the robot. So I need to go back and fix this one. So to go back, you have to click on return to the model from the result tab. And I'll go ahead and define a new joint to fix this. Now let's go for the second run. This is also pretty fast. Here you see a warning that says I have redundant constraints, which means that I defined uh, the, I defined a joint on a joint. So there are two joints on one place. Obviously, one is redundant. So uh, I need to go back. Remove that redundant joint and or replace it so with the correct correct joint and uh, move back to the uh, solving problem. Now let's see if that solved the problem. I still get this redundant. It says joint seven as redundant. So it's not needed. But let's see. The simulation works well, but we have an extra joint that 
is not needed. So I'm just going to go back and remove that joint and you won't get any warnings again. For that, uh, let's turn off the gravity. So uh, the problem is more simple and we can take a look on how the uh, driver is driving the joint. So I click on the solve and going back to results and play the animation. Now you see that the driver on the base of the robot is doing its job and rotating the robot around. Okay, now that the grabbers and other joints are fixed, I can play the motion. But you can still see that the grabbers are moving randomly. But I want to couple them together. So they close actually and mimic a claw. For that, uh, I need to go back and uh, use the couplers. Two, three, joint coupler, we'll do that. You can select two joints and uh, this will couple them together by a factor. You can change the scale and uh, it will change how they are connected. Here I solve and now you can see the grabbers are coupled together but they're not moving to the opposite way of each other. So I can go back and put a negative one for the scale of one of them. So uh, they are coupled in the opposite way now. Yeah, so this is how it should look like. To view the results or present the results or check uh, the results, you can uh, use the uh, X, Y result view here in the uh, motion navigator. So by clicking on joints or motion bodies, contacts, couplers, or anything that you have in the motion navigator tree, you get access to different information. For example, on this joint, I can plot force along Z axis, says FZ. And here you see the name of that joint and the force in Newton and the time on the x-axis. So if I play the animation, you see the change of the force in that joint, for example. You can also see the force magnitude along with the z-force, for example, and see how it changes.
Now, instead of using a driver for driving a joint, I want to use a DC motor, a real motor to apply torque and drive the joint. Now, you can uh, move to the uh, menu and note that you have to have the record dial solver. And then you go to the control and motor. From here, you have PMDC motor that you can select different specifications. And this will add a motor to your uh, navigation, motion navigation toolbar. To drive that motor, you need to have a signal chart. This signal is actually a voltage. So the software is multiplying the value on this signal to the voltage of the motor. Now, I can add different uh, signal values. So I start with one. So the signal value, the initial signal value is one. I want it to be negative one after two seconds. Now I have a signal that starts with one and goes to negative one after two seconds. So if I couple that on a joint by defining a driver, so I go to the driver and select the joint that I want to drive. And from here, you can have the, for example, joint uh, three, joint four. And uh, then from here, you can drive the joint four by using a motor. It will automatically pick the motor that you have in the list and the signal that you have in the list and couple everything together. So now the joint number four is being driven by a DC motor, which is being controlled by a signal. So I can turn off the uh, joint number two and then I uh, go and run the simulation. If I go back to result and play, you go, uh, you see it goes a little bit crazy. There's 24 motor, 24 volt motor is a bit strong. So now, now it looks more like a fan than a robot. Let's uh, drive another joint. Now remember that the motor is already defined. The signal is already there. The only thing you need to do is to assign the driver to a new joint. First, I'm going to make it uh, the icon as a, a little bit bigger so I know which joint I'm actually selecting. Then from the drivers, I switch, I select another joint uh, to be driven by using this motor and uh, this signal. So I select joint number three. And now we can see the icon on joint number three and also the direction. Now after uh, solving, I can play it again. It's still going crazy because this motor is too strong for the simulation. Now I can change the motor, but a better solution is actually to change the signal because you can reduce the signal value and that value is going to be multiplied by the voltage of the motor. So I bring it down to 10%, one tenth, and then uh, I can run the simulation again. I can solve and let's see how it moves. So it's way better than before and we can actually see the switch of the signal after two seconds next uh, i want to define a contact so by clicking on 3d contact you can open the contact window and you can select two bodies action and base that you want to have a contact with. Now there are some parameters here, so <clears throat> I'm gonna explain all different parameters that are being used in the contact window. A contact can be defined as a force or a contact force that is resisting an interference 
between two objects. So it's an outward force trying to move objects, you can say, out of each other. All right. And the software simulates this as a virtual spring. So imagine you put a spring between two objects, it keep them, keeps them in contact. Now, as you may remember, the force in a spring equals to the spring stiffness multiplied by the deflection displacement of the spring. Here we can say that displacement is the gap. So the force <clears throat> between two objects is equal to some imaginary stiffness multiplied by the gap. So if the gap opens up, that force will increase to keep the objects together. And as the gap goes to zero, the force goes to zero as the objects start to touch each other. Now this gap is usually a small. I mean the software starts to simulate contact when it reaches some threshold on the gap. It's not always doing, it's, the spring is not that long actually in practice. So the software start to simulate the contact when they are close enough, which you can say almost in contact. So the gap is pretty small. That, and that will generate a very small force that won't simulate the contact truly. That's why we have a stiffness exponent, which in reality for real springs doesn't exist. But here we need to amplify the magnitude of the force to actually keep the objects together or in touch. So we put an exponent. Now, you need to get these numbers right. And I will leave a link to a guideline that shows how you set these numbers to be correct for different contacts. So if you have a soft contact, then maybe you don't need the exponent and that will show the real behavior. But for example, if you have a steel, then you need a high exponent that generates a very big force right on impact. Now, if we put a spring between two objects, what you see is gonna look like this, and the simulation will probably fail. And it doesn't show the real contact between objects. As a result, we have to add a damper. Now, as you may recall from physics, damper, as the name implies, damps the vibration, slows down the vibration. And the way it does that, first of all, it's a negative force, so it's always in the opposite direction of the movement. If the green ball is going up, the damping force is downward, trying to slow it down. If it's going down, the damping force is upward, trying to slow it down. So it's always negative. And you see it's proportional to how fast the gap is changing. And C is constant, C is damping coefficient. So if the gap is opening up really fast, it will generate a really big force to keep the gap closed. And as the gap change speed slows down, the damping force is also, also slowing down. And the total force we have here is gonna be the spring force plus the damping force. And you can uh, see this uh, damping coefficient here in the material damping. Again, all these numbers need to be set correctly, otherwise you don't get the correct damping forces. In the next tab, you have the uh, friction parameters under the basic if you turn uh, Coulomb friction on. So if you turn the Coulomb friction on, you see the friction coefficient. Here you have a static coefficient and dynamic coefficient, which are different, and a static coefficient is always larger than dynamic coefficient. You probably remember from physics that static coefficient is uh, the friction when you start to move an object. If you notice, it's always harder to start the movement on an object but as you start the movement 
gets a bit easier to move the object. Now, there are a lot of theories explaining that. I'm not going to get into details, but that's how the physics works. The uh, static coefficient is bigger, but the change is not immediate. It's not like something has stopped and with a lot of friction. And as you move it, the friction drops immediately. It doesn't drop immediately. It takes a, some time. And that will be simulated by the software by using a figure that I'm showing on the left by the stiction velocity and friction velocity. So stiction velocity is the velocity that the static coefficient starts to drop. It's not a static anymore from that velocity. And the friction velocity is the velocity that from this point, it's totally dynamic now, okay? So you can have the same numbers, same values for stiction velocity and friction velocity. That means that the static coefficient drops to dynamic right immediately after the movement is started. Now let's go back to the tutorial and define the contact between uh, four parts. Now that the contact is defined, you can go back and uh, solve the simulation. Now you can see that the simulation time is much higher than before. It takes more time now because of the contact, because it requires searching. The software is searching for contact points on every iteration. Now let's run. And you can see that uh, the contact is there, but it's a bit weird. And the problem is that the objects were actually interfering to begin with, as you can see here. So I need to uh, go back to the modeling and move them a little bit to have some clearance before I start the contact, because at this position the gap is very high because of the interference and that generates a very big force very large contact force and that shoots the uh, arm out which makes unstable and unrealistic simulation so i try to move this arm out to some uh, clearance like this, so I don't have interference or an initial gap. Now I can move back uh, to the motion from application tab and run the simulation again. that the grabbers and the hand are moving freely actually even though there is no driver acting on them they're moving freely due to the force acting on them because of the motion so i i can't uh, define a damper between these two fingers so that will damp out the motion or prevent the motion unless the force is really big.
Now let's take a look at some results. For example, we can have a look at the torque magnitude on the uh, joints that we are driving. You can see that the torque is, for example, on a 3000 newton millimeter as it moves, especially when it's in contact. We have the maximum force because the motor is actually pushing on the other side of the arm. And as it starts to move, the torque actually reduces on the joint because there's nothing resisting the contact, uh, the movement anymore. Remember that there is no gravity. If there was gravity, we would see some initial torques instead of zero. <clears throat> We can also take a look at the force magnitude and also we can change uh, to other uh, things that we have in the motion navigator to check the forces or displacements. For example, here in contact, you can also see different parameters. If you select different joints, you can have different parameters you have displacements, velocity and acceleration for the motion body. And also we can find the motor drive specifications. For example, you can see the voltage, electric torque, and other stuff related to the motor. And you see the same torque around 3000 Newton millimeter being returned uh, from the motor. So this is a good way to validate if a motor is suitable for a specific task. You can also check the current. There is electric current and you can also check for the voltage and signal. Now here I make some changes. I just want to send the opposite signal. So it's not pushing uh, the other part that much it starts with a positive value and it starts with a negative value and then it changes to the positive so let's see some results on the motor we can see the torque here we still have around 3000 newton millimeters when it uh, touches the sides and starts pushing against the contact we get the maximum torque as expected this shouldn't happen usually you need end switch or end limits to cut the power but in this case we have it and we can actually see the current uh, according to the specification of the DC motor and we can compare it to the torque and you can see that the current that the motor is drawing is increasing and reaches a maximum of 6 amps as the torque goes up. So that's it for today. Next, I'm going to do some sensors on motion and then move on to finite element uh, simulation.